Hello everybody, my name is Paola Pasquali and I'm here to share some of, some of my thoughts about the, a lecture that has been titled Before, During and After COVID-19. And I don't have conflict of interest for this talk. The first thing that comes to mind is like, how can I speak about after if we're in the middle of another wave of COVID-19? So we are still in the during, actually. Um, but still, I think that the title means what happens to us dermatologists when COVID came and how that changed our perception uh, to that teledermatology. Because definitely COVID changed our perception, not only on teledermatology, but in medicine in general. And basically, these are just some numbers of how things went in my department before COVID. You know, we were working like everybody else, doing lots of surgery, because in our department, we get to see a lot of skin cancer. And then suddenly, in the middle of March last year, we had to stop suddenly. Uh, it was like a surprise, and we had to make fast decisions and the fastest thing to do since we were home and our family physicians who were the ones that sent us images through our telederm system were also home and then the only thing that was left for us was to make phone calls and we made a lot of phone calls and and the first thing that i can say about those phone calls is that definitely it allowed us to reach to our patients and, and to understand uh, what was happening to them and be close to them. So I, I can think of this type of telederm, a telederm that really touched more on compassion than anything else, which doesn't mean that it was not good. Actually, I think it was perfect for the moment we were all living. And as Dr. Oxveder says, I think compassion is one element that still telemedicine uh, has not been able to cover completely or has not thought of including it. But it's a part of the medical act that we need to keep in mind. So once we were back, we kept part of our, more than half of our activity as a telederm and also as a direct to consumer because we started calling our patients directly, which is something that we did not did before. We, we just had telederm or face-to-face -face consultations. But now we also had this direct to consumer tel telemedicine incorporated into our the workflow of our department. Um, does a phone call work? I think it can work very well. And this is a, a picture I got from a patient right before COVID. And, and, and I did not know anything about him anymore because he did not get the results. So I had to call him and tell him what to do in the meantime. Then I called back and talked to his brother who told me that the patient had been hospitalized for another condition. And when he came, to my surprise, he was looking this well because he had followed the instructions. He had cleaned all the cross. So this is how it looked with, without doing anything but the topical treatment that I had sent. So yes, you can solve problems or even with a phone call and um, put the patient in touch with his family at that moment was also something very nice that we achieved. So we, by including uh, phone calls, we, it, there has been a wave also of uh, uh, putting our waiting list down, the ones that had accumulated to, during COVID. Now, when you read about uh, the, the teledermatology, sorry, when you read about the impact of COVID, one of the interesting things is that, yes, there was a group of people or departments that never did teledermatology and there were others that did teledermatology for quite some time. But uh, once COVID came in, there was no difference between uh, any of us, basically, because none of us could do telederm the way we were used to do it. So our systems demonstrated how fragile they were, they were because we were counting on family physicians that were a, an essential part of this telederm and were not there anymore. I think the difference between the two groups is that the, for those that did telederm, there was the experience and there was the right attitude to, to 
see how we were going to work things out once COVID uh, allowed us to have images sent in. But I th certainly the groups that didn't cut up very fast. And, and that's why there are so many groups doing Telederm now more than ever. Uh, why we started Telederm many, many years ago? Well, we, because we wanted to make sure we lowered our waiting list, especially for our oncological patients. And indeed, uh, for us, it, it's one of the great values. We don't get to see at least 70, 80% of the consultations sent by family physicians. We give priority to oncology, so we are one of the hospitals with the lower waiting time uh, to see cancer, skin, skin cancer patients. So according to the CDC, definitely telehealth, it's done much more now than before COVID. And I found this very nice article on what is positive about this incorporation of telehealth. And basically, is this increase in patient utilization because now we have a new element, which is the direct-to-consumer. We have to include in our teledermatology that aspect that we did not consider before, that is doing the, the consultation directly with the patient. And in that regard, we it's good, like in number five, that we, inter, we integrate the data. There is integrated data sharing with the history of the patient with many elements that help us do a, a, a correct telemedicine. And, um, and that also the young generation really appreciate this wearable technology and remote patient monitoring. So, for instance, patients with psoriasis monitor themselves through uh, apps on their mobiles and they are in touch continuously with their physician and that it's really something patients like. We do have to improve this experience and see how we get around the fact that many of our oncology patients are older patients and they do need help with technology because they are not uh, they don't feel as comfortable as younger people. The telemedicine is great for chronic care management, ulcers, uh, and also for patients with acne. It works fantastic with uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, it has been a nice way of treating pediatric patients, and that definitely we will need a, an investment in technology. I just want to share the experiences that I found on the website of how to do telemedicine, and this is done by non-dermatologists. This is an Argentinian group that set this MAMO test where they had 12 centers doing mammographies and all these images were sent to specialists and they got to cover 350,000 women. That's a huge number. And um, they did these awareness campaigns, but in, they got to save millions of dollars in, to, to the health uh, system. Now, how can so few radiologists see so many uh, mammographies? Well, this was done because they got together with this German group that took care of, of, of analyzing the images through a triage through new, uh, that was done with artificial intelligence that selected those potentially suspicious exams from the normal exams. And that was the way they could see this huge amount of mammographs. And, and this is just an example of, you know, of using artificial intelligence uh, to to solve you know a large number of patients another group that came out of covid is this group that is doing orthodontics it's i i thought this was amazing because basically they send the kit to the persons that registers they get the kit they get the print from their teeth they do it at home and then they they create the aligners and send them to the patient. So they you don't have to move from home to get an aligner. So this is a way orthodontics is also working uh, via telemedicine. There are many experiences. Uh, retinopathies are being studied even from uh, the optometrist. They send the images to ophthalmologist via telederm. Uh, via telemedicine, sorry. Uh, there are also ways of recognizing signs of strokes and Alzheimer's. So the telemedicine move is moving in many, many aspects. Uh, so uh, if we did a storm forward telederm 
before COVID in a one-to-one -one relation. Uh, lockdown brought in many new elements, the direct-to-consumer uh, relationship and the fact that there will be a time when we will not have the family physician to send images. So we will need the patients to get involved and send the images themselves. With this long post lockdown that is on and off and on and off, like we are in the, at this moment right now, we are in a hybrid situation. So we're getting phone calls from patients. We still, do, we do have the, our, storing forward system working and we are reserving the spots at the hospital for patients that really need it. But definitely this is not the solution. We do need to incorporate in the near in the near future um, AI because we need to see many, many patients and we need to have good triage as done through artificial intelligence and just keep those patients that really need our attention. How? What is the you know the quit for this? We need good images and maybe somehow this is the crusade I have. I do think we need to train people, family physicians, and everybody to do correct imaging because the only way of doing a correct diagnosis is to have a right image. I myself, uh, during the COVID, uh, made this uh, in YouTube, I put this video, to, it's for free, it's just to teach people, you know, the five elements that are necessary for a good image. But, you know, I know there are other people that have done it, and I think that this is what we need to do. I mean, if we want algorithms to work correctly, we need good images. If we want to do a good uh, story and forward uh, teledera, we need good images. So I think these are the ideas I wanted to leave you with. And I want to thank again the organizing committee for inviting me to be here with you. And finally, I want to close just saying that hopefully we won't have COVID uh, by 2023 and that we can all meet in Singapore at the World Congress. Thank you very much.